In the second reading today, St. Paul says that he would absolutely love to go to heaven. He'd love to go not sometime in the future, but right now. But then he said, but he realized that he had a duty, he had work to do still here on earth. And that for the sake of those to whom he could minister, he, he preferred to stay on earth. And that should be all our aspiration. To go to heaven is absolutely wonderful. If you're walking with the Lord, you have no reason to fear death. If you're walking with the Lord. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Okay, the death itself may not be nice. But what we experience on the other side, if we're walking with the Lord, if we're walking with the Lord, that will be beyond anything we have ever experienced here on earth. Some years ago I brought out the book, I Want to Go to Heaven the Moment I Die. And that should be each of our desire. To so live that the very moment we die, that we will be able to go straight to heaven. And that is God's will for us. Anything short of that means we haven't been truly walking in God's ways. If we walk in God's ways, then his desire is to take us straight up. Straight up. Now for the book, I want to go to heaven the moment I die, I studied quite a number of people's near-death experiences. And I deliberately set out to study the near-death experiences, first of all, of those who had walked with God. Secondly, those who had believed in God, but who um, hadn't really walked with him. Thirdly, those who had rejected him. And fourthly, those who had never had a chance to come to know him. And it's very interesting some of the near-death experiences from that range of people which I have blended in the book. Take George Rodaniah. George Rodaniah was brought up without a chance to know God. It wasn't his fault he didn't know God. He was brought up in atheist Russia. But he was a believer in what was good and a, a loving person. Because he was working for liberation within Russia, the KGB assassinated him and left him for dead. His body was taken to the mortuary. Not merely was his body taken to the mortuary, but it was placed in the fridge in the mortuary for four days before the autopsy could be performed. And it was only when the surgeon was beginning to cut into him for the autopsy, guess what? George came alive on the slab. You can guess the shock that the surgeon got. And you can guess how cold George was feeling after being in four days in the fridge. But he had a remarkable story to tell on the, of what he experienced on the other side. Before his experience on the other side, he was an atheist. After his experience of meeting Jesus on the other side, not merely was he a believer, but he immediately set to become a priest in the Orthodox Church in Russia. The fact that he had a wife and a couple of children would have sort of ruled out the Catholic Church to some extent anyway. But he became a priest in the Orthodox Church in Russia. Or then, take the case of Dr. Howard Storm. Dr. Howard Storm had a chance to know Jesus as a child. But growing up, going to university, you could say that he rejected God by degrees. In other words, the more degrees he got in university, the more he rejected God. And he developed a chip on his shoulder against Christians. Ever meet any of those sort of people? And then he had the misfortune to be in a particular place where no medical facilities were available. He took seriously ill and he effectively left his life. Now, his experience on the other side was not so pleasant. He had rejected God. He found himself in the presence of evil spirits. But somehow on the other side, he managed to get back to his childhood love for Jesus and managed to cry out to Jesus from the other side and then came into freedom on the other side as he cried out to Jesus. 
Before his experience, he was a bitter atheist. After his experience, not merely was he a believer, but he became a Methodist minister and went as a missionary to South America. I'm not sure if he's still alive or not. Uh, George Rodaniah died again there a few years ago, and uh, this time he obviously has remained dead. Or then, to take a very different example, take a Gloria Polo. Gloria Polo, a Catholic who rejected church teaching, who embraced the modern uh, understanding of sexuality, who encouraged her nieces uh, and her nephews, girlfriends to have abortions. And she had often said as a child, when she was telling lies, any time she was telling lies as a child, she used to say, may I be struck by lightning if I'm not telling the truth. And guess what happened? She was struck by lightning. A devastating strike by lightning. Her nephew beside her was killed instantly. She was most seriously ill. Found herself outside her body. Found herself literally being taken to the doors of hell. And started crying out, I'm a Catholic, I shouldn't be here. And God showed her she should be. But somehow again she managed to come to repentance and she attributes that to a person who hearing of her death started praying intensely for her. And she was shown that on the other side that his prayers, I'm not sure whether it was his prayers saved her from hell or his prayers saved her to be able to come back into this life. And as soon as she came back she absolutely dedicated her life to serving God. Or then take Don Piper. Don Piper loved God, loved his wife, loved his family. He was actually attending a weekend like what we are doing here today, a weekend Christian conference. And it was on his way home that his car was struck by a, a 16-wheeler or an 18, an 8-wheeler or whatever. A big juggernaut went over his car and crushed him inside it. He was declared dead by the first doctor who came on the scene. A more senior doctor had to be called to, to have him declared dead in order that his body wouldn't have to be brought to hospital. So he was declared dead again. Then a friend of his uh, arrived on the scene and started praying with him, felt inspired to pray with him, even though in their denomination they don't believe in praying for the dead. But his friend started praying with him, praying over him, singing over him, etc. And a stage came running out of words and his a friend started singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. And guess he's surprised when the dead man started singing it with him. But he had a remarkable story to tell of a rising up at the gates of heaven and of meeting his extended family who had come before him at the gates of heaven who were there to welcome him. And one particularly, to my mind, interesting little detail which tells us something about heaven was his meeting with his grandmother. His grandmother was a Native American who had had a very, very tough life and all Don ever remembered of her was this little old woman walking along all bent over, her face all wrinkled up and without a tooth in her head because while she had dentures they were very seldom in her mouth. And there she was at the gates of heaven waiting to meet him, standing completely upright, her face radiant and with the most perfect set of teeth in her mouth that were clearly her own. Good news, everybody. When we go up there, we'll have a complete makeover. Those of us, our hair, whose hair is getting, sh uh, getting a bit scarce, come, and we won't have to bother about hairdressing. I haven't gone to a hairdresser since last February. Snip my own. Won't have to worry about that up above. And if, if you have dentures or teeth missing, they'll be looked after too. Complete makeover up above. Up above, we will have a spiritual body. We are composed now of spirit, soul and body. Our Blessed Mother prayed, My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. The letter to the Hebrews tells us that the word of God has the power to cut right into where the spirit meets the soul. It's our spirit that will live on. And our spirit, as St. Paul again explains elsewhere, our spirit will have a spiritual body that will look very much like our earthly body here on earth. Isn't that good news? We'll know one another, but a complete makeover. Praise God. 
But perhaps the near-death experience that touched me most, or that the Lord used to touch me most, was of a non-Christian, Barbara Harris Whitfield. Now, just one thing about spiritual experiences. The fact that a person has a spiritual experience doesn't mean that they will understand it properly. And it doesn't mean that they'll have a proper understanding of God afterwards. It doesn't even mean that they'll totally walk in God's ways afterwards. But Barbara Harris Whitfield, she was a victim of intense cruelty when a child. She was victim of intense emotional deprivation. And during her near-death experience, as she was lifted up, she says she was permeated by love. Permeated, that the love lifted her up, went right through her. And she thinks it wasn't the Christian God she encountered because she didn't see anybody looking by, like Santa Claus. Clearly she hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit. I am absolutely satisfied that Barbara Harris Whitfield had a most intense encounter with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Love, that the Spirit of Love went right through her on the other side. Jesus said, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Did it ever strike you that here on earth those who mourn very often are not comforted? Has it ever struck you that those who are grieving because of the way they were treated as children often are not comforted? That those who have suffered bad things in life often are, are not uh, uh, comforted? That those who have experienced deep emotional deprivation often are not comforted here on earth? Well, I have good news for all victims today. The good news is if you make any effort at all to walk with God, that you will be comforted. That when you go to the other side, you will have an experience of God's love that's beyond all comprehension here on earth. That God's love will go right to the depths of your being. That all the negative emotions and negative feelings, all those will be dealt with. In the case of Barbara Harris Whitfield, they were dealt with. In your uh, case, if you make any reasonable effort to walk with God, once you go to the other side, the love of God will go right through you. Will go right through you. Lift you up. Make you feel loved in a way you have never felt loved before. Take away all the anguish. Take away all the inner emptiness. The love of God will lift you up. Now when I say if you make any effort to walk with God at all, to clarify that, if you make serious wrong choices here on earth, after you have experienced the love of God, you may still have to face the serious wrong choices you have left, made on earth. That's another question for another homily. But the good news is, if you are suffering within yourself, if there's emotional deprivation within you, if there's anguish within you, if there's emptiness within you, I absolutely guarantee you that you will be lifted up by God's love, embraced by God's love, and experience love in a way that you never thought possible. Here on earth we may sometimes get a little touch of it. Back many years ago, two years before my ordination, I walked into a prayer meeting in Dublin after years of inner emptiness, so much so that I experienced it as if there was a hole within me. After years of suicidal desires, I was prayed with that night. Nothing happened while I was being prayed with. I was rushing away in disappointment after the meeting when suddenly I had a beautiful experience of a ball of heat coming alive in my chest and a sense that I was being touched by Jesus. Again, that's a subject for another talk. But the bottom line is that I've already experienced something of those who more than being comforted. And I know that what Barbara Harris Whitfield said was true because it lit up for me. And also indeed, as I read her story, 
parts of the New Testament lit up for me in a way that had never lit up for me before. Even as I read our stories, sections of the New Testament came alive in my mind. Where Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, because they shall be called children of God. Why are peacemakers children of God? Because God absolutely is love. That's his very essence. Again, the passage came alive for me where Jesus said, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you, and then you will be sons and daughters of your Father, who causes his Son to shine on bad men and good men alike. Why do we become sons and daughters of God the Father when we forgive, when we pray for those who are hurting us? Because God, who is love, can only be served by love. And it's when we learn to serve God by love, that's when we become sons and daughters of the Father. But I'm going to make a point now. I regret that I have to make it today. And yet, I feel that it is necessary to make it today, and to make it again and again and again. I am speaking today of the wonders of heaven. Do not for one moment think that I have the same beliefs and the same attitudes as those who say, Oh, everybody's going to go to heaven. That, to my mind, is not right teaching. In, in the prophet Ezekiel, there are a couple of very clear passages. I'll read the shorter one. There's two. There's a longer passage and a shorter one which say the same thing. I'll read the shorter one. As for you, O son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word from my mouth and give them the warning from me. If I say to the wicked person, O wicked person, you will surely die, but you do not speak out to dissuade him from his way, then that wicked man will die in his, in, in his iniquity. But I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you warn the wicked man to turn from his way and he does not turn from it, he will die in his iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now what if that is the true word of God? And I believe it is. I believe it is. Where does that word of God leave those who say to the, to the sinner, Ah, it's okay, we're all going to go to heaven anyway. And that is being said. That is being said. And if God warns through the prophet Ezekiel that if we do not challenge people to face up to the truth about their lives, then we take their guilt upon ourselves. Well, how is it going to go with those who say, ah, everybody's going to go to heaven? No need for repentance. No need for conversion. Listen to what Jesus himself had to say. In Matthew 7.22, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And again, Jesus said on another occasion, a couple of occasions, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I tell you? And Jesus very clearly warned of the reality of hell. He warned of the reality of hell with exactly the same sort of vivid imagery as road authority, safety authorities warned of the dangers of drink driving and of speeding when driving. To my mind, this is my thinking, but to my mind, those who declare that everybody is going to heaven, I think it's a form of heresy. Now, I'm not competent to declare, to declare what is heresy and what's not heresy. But I think it's, a, it's bordering on heresy, possibly heresy. But those who make that claim are they not saying that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about when he warned of the dangers of hell. So how are they going to fare when they go before him? If to them not preaching the gospel message, if to them not calling people back from their sins, 
How are they themselves going to fare before they go before God? And I would like to address my next few words to everybody who is watching this video and indeed to those here present today. If somebody is giving you advice that is contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ, listen to Jesus Christ. Perhaps there's somebody watching this video who is going down the wrong path as a result of advice given to them by a priest or even by a bishop, God save us. I went through a bad patch in my first year after ordination. First of all, Jesus had only come into my life and I hadn't dealt with the issues. And then I got caught in the middle of certain things happening that shouldn't have been happening uh, in my first year after ordination and I got a sort of disillusion. I got more than a sort of disillusion. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I turned to a priest for advice. And I have to say the advice he gave me was very, very, very bad advice. Thankfully, shortly afterwards, I had the opportunity of speaking with a lay person who was not a Catholic. A Christian evangelist who was not a Catholic. And she held before me the word of God. And today I thank God that I listened to her and I listened to the word of God being faithfully presented to me. And I did not listen to what that priest said to me. And so I say to you, if there's somebody giving you advice at this moment in time that is contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ, listen to the teaching of Jesus Christ. If you are living your life in a way that is contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ, I hold before you the realities of heaven. But there are steps to be taken in order to enter heaven. I call you back to the teaching of Jesus Christ. If there's anything in your life that you're putting before God, if you're putting material things before God, now is the time for you to wake up and turn back to God. If you're allowing bitternesses and resentments to take over your life, bring them to God, deal with them. If you're full of jealousy or envy or anything like that, Bring it to God. Deal with it. If in the area of relationships you're not walking with God, I call to you. Deal with it. Seek to do th things God's way. God's way does not appear the easiest way. But it is the only way that leads to everlasting happiness. And so I pray... Lord Jesus, I pray for the grace for all of us to walk in your ways, to witness to your ways, to live by your teaching. I pray for those who will watch this video. If there's anybody watching this video who's in, in, in a compromised situation, I pray, Lord, the grace for them to turn back to your right now. In the words of the first reading today. Seek the Lord while he is still to be found. Call to him while he is still near. Let the wicked man abandon his ways. The evil man his thoughts. Let him turn back to the Lord who will take pity on him. To our God who is rich and forgiving. And I pray that grace for every person. Turn towards God. Even if you're not able to deal with everything today. Turn towards God. And express a prayer, a desire that you will reach the stage to be able to, reach, to deal with everything. And may the power of the Holy Spirit come upon you to set you free and to deliver you. And may we indeed have the grace to be able to so live that we will go to heaven the very moment we die. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for your great patience.
Should anybody desire confession, I will make myself available now in a couple of moments. A couple of weeks here ago, I gave a talk on mindfulness and the dangers of mindfulness. Um, there's an expanded version of that talk in the October issue of the Curate's Diary. Thank you very much. God bless you. And each Sunday at the moment, we're having afternoons of prayer.